Welcome to Entrepreneurship 101 for those in the audience and also for those on the webcast. I'm going to embarrass uh, Gordon, who um, does our filming every week. Uh, his father was actually Terry Graham, which was the guy in the white shirt with a really low voice. So it's a small community entrepreneurship, and they're uh, just north of Toronto doing pond biofuels. Fuels. So I have a, a number of announcements before we get on with our lecture today. We're really excited to have John Doctorum, um, the uh, leader of our clean tech practice here today to talk to us about go-to-market strategy. But before I introduce John, um, a couple announcements. One is that on our LinkedIn group, um, for those following it, uh, we're, we're getting a lot of people joining, which we're really excited about, and we're trying to get some interaction going. And what happened last week was there was a suggestion that some people wanted to meet um, others in the group and that they met after the last week's Entrepreneurship 101 group. The, the organizers in the audience, I think she's going to stand up. Do you want to just stand up? And So if anyone is interested in meeting up after today's Q&A, um, you're meeting just by the escalators, down by the escalators. And um, Unfortunately, with the format that we have, it's hard for us to um, to facilitate networking more than a couple times a year, so we really appreciate that you've taken the initiative to do that, and we hope you guys uh, take advantage of that. Also in the LinkedIn group, there is, seems like it is student entrepreneurship competition season. Uh, we've posted a number of competitions that you might want to look into. There's the OCE Social Enterprise Student Competition listed there, the OCE Video Competition, um, the Business Development Bank of Canada Young Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur Award Contest, which is a huge one. It's a $100,000 one. And there's several other competitions posted there. So if you're interested, uh, join our group if you haven't already. Um, we're getting, it's about 200 people almost 300 now, actually. Um, and very important, um, important announcement uh, for next week. Next week, we've, we added sales as a lecture, I think, last year. And it's been hard because our audience has been changing, and traditionally, we would do B2B sales. So what we're going to try to do, it's very hard in an hour, so we're ex extending the lecture to be an hour and a half, and we're going to cover B2B and B2C sales. So for those of you who don't know, B2B is when you're selling business to business. And um, we're starting, that technically, or most often is what the audience for technology companies are often selling business to business, but as you add social innovation and more consumer digital content companies and you know apps, these types of things, it's more B2C or business to consumer. So it's a completely different way to sell. So we're going to break that up into two parts. Um, I think it's valuable to attend both, it's just to get your, wrap your head around what the differences are. Um, and uh, I think hopefully that'll go well when we try to take on the two big types of sales. So um, lastly, also in the LinkedIn group, um, if we're trying to get your feedback a little bit more prior to the lecture, so we're going to put uh, something on there asking for questions. So if there's specific questions that you want um, the speaker to cover, you can always post on there and we'll feed those to the speaker each week. So, and now I'd like to introduce John Doctorum. You might recognize him if you've been following since the beginning. Uh, he was involved with our Lived It lecture and Meet the Entrepreneurs in the Clean Tech Practice. He's our senior advisor um, in the Clean Tech Practice here, um, he, where he works with uh, an advisory team that works with clean tech companies both in the GT and across Ontario. Before he joined Mars, he led the business development team for Hydrogenics Corporation, where he focused on strategic partnerships, product development, and sales and marketing. Um, during his time with Hydrogenics, he was involved in the introduction and launch of both the company's fuel cell and hydrogen generation divisions and the overall strategic planning. He was also previously involved with the Pimbina Institute where he led corporate consulting services on low impact renewable energy and, and energy policy. So welcome, John. Thanks very much. Um, great to be here. I, I did this uh, lecture on, on go-to-market strategy for the first time last year, and uh, I really in, enjoyed doing it, and I, um, hopefully people were able to get a lot out of it, and we can try to accomplish uh, the same tonight. It's um, not an easy thing to do uh, in that normally in advisory services, I'm working with one client one-on-one, -on -one. And the specifics of their product and their path to market, um, it, it's, it's easy when you're focused on, on one thing and one type of business. But obviously, all of you are working in very different fields, have different types of products and different types of customers. 
but there are some uh, key things that are going to be common in a go-to-market strategy and, and what I'm going to try to do is focus on a lot of those common elements. Um, I'm also going to provide you with some uh, examples from my own experience to hopefully help put things in context a little bit. So on a, on a go-to-market strategy, um, the first thing I, I want to emphasize is that your go-to-market strategy is about more than just the sales and marketing team. It needs to involve your product development team and it needs to involve your technical team. And one of the most important things uh, that I can think of about it is, is the fact that you really need to focus on your customer's perspective. And I'm going to go through uh, some of the characteristics of a customer buying process and the different things that you need to be doing while they're making their buying decision. So we'll focus on uh, educating the customer about our solution, proving our capabilities to them, differentiating ourselves from the competition, and ultimately scaling up our strategy. So uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, you, you probably heard a little bit of it in my uh, bio or, or my introduction, and um, Carrie alluded to, you know, differences between business to business, B2B, and B2C selling. Now, my background has always been in uh, technology and uh, primarily energy-related products. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about relates to B2B. Uh, with a go-to-market strategy. And um, specifically, I would normally be selling a product to an original equipment manufacturer, to someone that would, would take it as a component and incorporate it into part of their product offering. So I just want to mention that now so you have some, some context around the examples that I use. Um, so I started off with talking about the customer-oriented perspective. And um, the first thing when it comes to a strategy, whether it's a, a, a corporate strategy or, or sales strategy, to me it really needs to start with some fundamental questions. And the three fundamental questions are what I have up here. Um, first is how are you creating value for your customer? How are you delivering value to them? And the third is how are you capturing the value? When people think about capturing the value, the immediate thing that comes to mind is revenue. And yeah, that's an important factor. But in your go-to-market strategy, some of your early customers, the ways in which you're going to capture value from them relates more to how you're going to be able to incorporate success with them into your marketing going forward. So um, what I want to do is um, put the, the definition of, of the go-to-market plan in a little more context. Um, what you'll be finding is, is over the course of the next few weeks, there will be more detailed series on sales and distribution channels. And so we'll use this as more of a uh, broad, all-encompassing look at the strategy on the uh, sales or the go-to-market side. And some of the key questions that the strategy and the plan need to address, um, first of all, probably of, of the most importance, is figuring out where you fit in the value chain of the industry that you're in. And that relates back to what I was saying about you know, providing to an original equipment manufacturer. Typically, in a lot of the strategies that I used, I would not have that much interaction with the actual end customer, right? I would be working through a partnership with an OEM who would then be delivering it on. And sometimes there's multiple OEMs within a value chain as well. You might be incorporating one widget into a product that then 
is getting incorporated into something bigger that's going on to the uh, end customer. So partnerships, figuring out your place in the value chain is really important. Um, the other thing that you need to start thinking about is how is your sales team going to be structured? Is it going to be structured regionally? Is it going to be structured by application? What is the support philosophy, the methods of training that you're going to use? And all of the answers to these questions when you're figuring out your strategy are going to differ depending on, on really three key things. One is the complexity of your solution. The other is the price level of the product or the service that you're selling. And the third is the relative disruptiveness. We'll get into uh, some more details on that. So this is um, something that, that I've used a couple times in trying to understand the market. And um, what I want to do is, is, is just describe to you uh, what you're looking at here. <clears throat> so on this axis, we're looking at price per unit. You can look at it as selling price per unit. And over here, volume and time. One of the biggest challenges um, that, that I've faced before in the past is that the product that we have is actually applicable to a bunch of different markets. And there are a bunch of different types of customers that we can go after. And I've always used, this is, is, is simplifying it a bit, but use this type of process to figure out where we target, who we target first before we get to the how we go about targeting them. So every dot that you see here represents a different market or a different application for a product. The size of the bubble is how big is the actual market, how much could you potentially sell into it. And the color that you see has to do with the value proposition of the product in that market. So when you see a green bubble, that means that the product has high value in that market. The customer is going to appreciate it. It might not be because it's lower priced, but it might be because it's saving them a lot of operational costs. Or there might be another factor in the value proposition. So the reason why I have all of these up there is that it helps to focus the organization on what the early markets are, right? And as soon as you have success in one of these high-priced, low-volume markets, you can start to drive your costs down over time as you start to increase your volume. The interesting thing is that you're typically not going to get this exactly right. What will generally end up happening is that a certain type of customer or a certain type of application starts to pull you more in their direction, which is a great thing. That's exactly what you want to start to have happen over time with your product. But this is a great way to, to, to really look at the different markets, look at different types of customers, and try to start to compare them against each other and look at the advantages of one market over another one. The other thing that's really important when you're thinking about this is it's really important to understand where your technology is going, how it's going to improve over time. What is it that you need to do to your product in order to be able to get to this high volume market down the road. And we would always be careful not to go too far off our technology path in order to serve some of these early markets. You would of course have to make some, some changes to the technology in order to get some early revenue in one market. But the important thing is to always stay focused on where your technology is going for some of those big markets. All of you have, have probably seen a, a chart like this in one way or another before. 
Um, just as it's important to understand your technology and to understand the value proposition in a particular market, it's really important to understand the different customers within a market. So if we go back to that chart for a second, to the last one. So let's now assume that we're focused in on one particular market and one particular application. Very different characteristics of customers as you start to get into that market. The first um, area where you start to make sales is really with the innovators and the early adopters. People have probably heard that term before, early adopters. Some of the first people to try out and to test out new technology. Those are what we call early adopters. If you have something that is new and novel, a technology that allows someone to do something that they haven't been able to do before, you will very easily get some early adopters. The question is whether or not the number of early adopters will be enough to sustain your business. Typically, no. There will be a few out there and you'll be able to sell at a relatively high price to them just because they're so keen on trying it out. But the area where you need to focus your product development and your sales efforts are really on getting to the majority of customers in that field. Every dotted line that you see here represents a very significant shift for the organization. And the gap that you see here is the typical area where companies start to come across problems. And there's ones that make it over this gap and others that don't. But to give you an idea on how these lines change your organization in these different transition points, a lot will have to do with your manufacturing. That's one obvious area where things will start to change. As your volume increases, you're not going to be able to build things to get them out there the same way that you built them before. You'll be bringing in automation and that type of thing. The other thing that will happen is the characteristics of your sales team will start to change. You're going to have to focus more on a one-to-many model and do some different things in the way of marketing in order to attract the majority and, and uh, leave the early adopter stage. This to me is a really um, important thing to think about, and I mentioned it right at the beginning. It's the customer's buying process. And the reason why it's important is as a customer is going through their buying process, there are certain things that your organization has to be doing in order to close the gate and move on to the next one and keep going along with their buying process. And I, I always like to have people think about this in really simple terms. Um, like you're, you're, you're going out to buy a car. You're going out to buy a car, you just need to think about the different processes that you go through. So starting at the very beginning for a customer, there's problem recognition. So they know that they need a new car, or they know that they need your product or something that does uh, what your product is able to do, they need it for their business. Once they recognize that they have a problem, they're going to start their information search. And this is when it's really important for you to be focused on letting them know that your solution is out there for the problem that they're faced with. And we'll get into um, some, some possible ways of doing that. Um, but, right, you need to let people know that you sell cars so that you're there for the people that are buying them. Then, as their information search continues, they're going to start to look at all of the alternatives that are out there. And they're going to start to look at your product versus the other ones that could solve the same problem. They're then going to get into a purchase decision where you're hoping to be there negotiating with them. And then they're going to go into their post-purchase evaluation. And uh, that's an important time to 
where the go-to-market strategy doesn't end with the sale. Uh, much of the things that you need to do begin at that point in time in order for you to increase your sales pipeline and get repeat orders. So starting with the, the, the first part, educating the customer on your solution. So we, we see a lot of different ventures in the uh, clean tech practice here at Mars. And um, one thing that I'm always nervous about is when an entrepreneur comes in and explains that uh, there's a problem out there that no one else knows about. And, you know, they want to start the process of educating their customers on what the problem is. That's a very difficult position to be in. Trying to sell someone a car when they don't think they need one <laughs> is extremely difficult. So what I like to, to focus on is more just letting them know that their problem can be solved with your technology or with the product that you're offering. One of the ways, a, a bunch of different ways to do this, but one of the ways that, that, that I've used a lot in the past is uh, white papers and magazine articles and getting your product out there to the right people. So going to conferences where it's very targeted in the sector that you're focused on and being able to present to people some technical data and some information about your product and how it solves their problem. The other thing that I think is really important in, in educating people about your solution is to get some powerful partners on board early on. And, and I'll get into uh, some more details about how I've done that in the past. Um, but being able to draw upon the marketing machine of a larger organization that you're partnering with is really important at this stage so they can start spreading the word about your product and uh, how it can solve the problem that you're going after. Once people know that your solution exists to their problem, they're going to start evaluating it and they're going to start looking at it and comparing it to the alternatives that are out there, your competition that's out there in the field that's able to solve the same problem. And uh, this is a, a, a really important stage and um, now what, what I want to do is talk about one of the ways that uh, I've focused on doing this in the past. Um, for, for quite a while I was uh, providing backup power systems. And uh, they were alternative backup power systems, fuel cell backup power systems. So they could back up uh, anything that a diesel generator or a battery could back up. The first thing that we did is we looked into the specific niche applications that we wanted to focus on, where we were adding a significant amount of value to the customer. And the area that we settled on was telecom backup power. So all of the cell phone sites that are out there have either a diesel generator or a battery system. And we decided that that was the area where there's a premium on backup power, where reliability and availability are really important to the customer. Because if there's a power outage and the tower goes down, everyone on that tower loses their calls and it starts to create a lot of turnover. Once you lose your call a few times with a telecom carrier, you end up switching to another carrier. Um, we also started to focus on uh, geographies where cell phone usage was, was rampant and the electrical grid was not as stable as it is here. So what would happen is we would get into discussions with the telecom company and we'd often show up for our initial meeting and we'd power up the system there in their office building and show them that it works. But demonstrating something in the office building was one thing and having them have the confidence that we could drop this at a remote telecom site and it would just work every time the power went out was a totally different thing. 
So what we ended up doing was uh, making some pretty significant investments into field trials and demonstrations with these different telecom carriers. And we had to be really careful about this because it was important for us to uh, manage the risks, the risks to us, a lot of financial risk when we were deploying these systems, often at no cost at the beginning to the carrier. The way that we would manage it would be to set the very clear expectations with the customer. If we meet the following requirements, then we knew that they would be there to buy 20 or 50 or 100 of them later on. So that was how we went about mitigating our risk with it. And it was a resource intensive process too, because as much as I would tell them in the boardroom, I have full confidence that this will work out in the middle of nowhere for 50 days, I would typically have a field engineer that wasn't far away in case something did go wrong. Um, so it was a bit of a, a, a costly uh, process that we had to be careful about. What I want to show you here, though, is an example of a deployment that we did. And the reason why we did this was because we had to prove to the customer that our technology would meet their needs. And this customer decided that they would give us a pretty tough area to work in. What you're looking at here is a failure duration in hours, and you're looking at days. So this was a 50-day trial, and the period of outages at this telecom site was often even up in the neighborhood of eight hours a day. This was uh, actually located uh, just outside of Delhi in India, so a place where there's lots of cell phone use going on, lots of competition within the market. You couldn't afford to be dropping calls for people. So in this 50-day trial, we successfully made it through 235 outages, and the unit ran for 126 hours. What was amazing about this was every time the power went out and the system came on, we would get an email, tell us that the system is on, it would tell us how long the system ran for, and it would tell us how much power was used and when it went off. At the end of the day, we were able to provide the telecom company with information and data that they had never seen before. They didn't know how often the diesel generator was coming on. They didn't know how often the batteries were performing. And arming them with that data really helped to empower them. It helped to empower the network manager to go back to the office and say, look, I now have an understanding as to how much revenue we're potentially losing out at this site. <clears throat> and that to us was, uh, was, was the key to winning early customers, proving the technology in the real world. So just to go back for a second, so at this point in the, in, in, in the buying process, we were still very much in the evaluating alternative stage, right? Showing them what we could do compared to what the competition and the other uh, options that were out there, the other technology choices. Once you, you, you get through that process, then what will typically happen in a B2B scenario when you're working with an OEM, um, especially in telecom or any of those industries, they will typically go out with a request for proposal where they get all of the competitors and all of the potential solutions to submit proposals. And it's always um, a difficult position to be in. You don't necessarily know what the competition is doing, what they're pricing things at. But what I found to be really important were a few different things. One was, first of all, putting our solution in context. And using the data that I just showed you was the best way to be able to do that. 
So I would be able to go to the customer and actually explain to them, not that they had a problem, they already knew that they had a problem, but I'd be able to put the size of the problem into context for them in the way of dollars and cents and what dropped calls cost them and how many were potentially happening. So I think putting things into context, letting them know the extent to which you understand their problem is the best place to start um, when it comes to responding to a proposal like that. On the solution, you have to clearly show them what you're proposing, how you're going to take care of different things, whether it be warranty and service and deploying and installing units out there. On pricing, you have to be able to cover a lot of different options for them. You don't necessarily know going into the proposal stage what options they want. Um, so we would often structure it very much like a menu where they could pick and choose some different components of what they wanted. I'm keen on providing terms and conditions right up front in a request for proposal so that they understand uh, where you're coming from and the scope of your delivery. And then also, of course, supporting documentation. And this is where any reference sites, any third-party um, third party validation on what you have becomes really important. I think the most important thing to realize with um, the submission of a, of a proposal when, you, when you're trying to get to the negotiation stage is that a lot of the people who are looking at it, you haven't met before. And there will be business people looking at it and technical people looking at it, and they're probably looking at quite a few responses. So you have that first kind of three minutes to sell them on it. And that's where I found that having data and be able to put things into context for them right up front was so valuable. To be able to teach them something about the magnitude of their problem was really important right up front. You'll be having a session uh, w within this series on the pitch, which I think will be geared mainly towards investors. But the way to look at your interactions with customers is very much the same way. It's a pitch, it's just a slightly different uh, audience. And the proposal is just a different format of the pitch. <clears throat> the other thing that I find is really important is to, to differentiate yourself from the competition. And I mentioned early on the idea of partnerships um, and, and what that can do for you. The, the way that we used partnerships was um, in the example, sticking with the, the backup power example, we knew how to build really good fuel cell technology and we knew how to build a really good controller that would run it and whatnot. But we didn't know a lot about deploying things in the middle of nowhere. There were existing OEMs out there that focused on designing cabinets that no matter what the ambient temperature was, these cabinets would maintain their internal temperature. Um, they would have batteries, diesel generators, all types of different equipment in the cabinet. And we would go forward with a proposal that included a really reputable cabinet supplier um, that the carrier, the telecom company, would recognize the name of and they would be comfortable. It was amazing how, how important it would be for them to be comfortable with the packaging and the steel box that it was in. Um, and it meant a, a lot to them um, to have that comfort and to know that the OEM that we're working with on the cabinet side has the faith in our technology to put it in there as well. Um, the other way that we uh, structured partnerships too, I mentioned early on uh, white papers and helping get your solution out there when people are in the, the problem recognition stage and letting them know that your solution is available. One of the key things that we did also was we would do the white paper along with an OEM and with one of our early customers that we had done a demonstration with. And then we would 
go down to a conference, a network power conference on uh, telecom, and we would actually have the OEM and that first customer present the white paper to the crowd. And it was a much different perspective. It wasn't me up there trying to, to peddle my technology. It was a peer-to-peer -peer interaction where this person was sharing some of the knowledge that they had gained from doing our trial. And they wouldn't sugarcoat it. There would always be issues that would come up in trials and they'd share those with the group. And that, that was actually probably the most effective uh, tool that I found in being able to get out there to the market was to have a customer help do the sale to the other potential customers. So next thing I want to talk about is the, the purchase decision and uh, the negotiation that goes along with it. You've heard it many times before, and it's cliche, but people buy from people. And uh, what's really important at the negotiation stage is the relationship that you've been able to establish with the organization. And if you've done a demonstration or a field trial with them or provided them with a prototype, that's the way that you build these relationships and how they get established. I think the um, two really important things that I want to mention on negotiation. When you go into it, you have to know exactly what your company is willing to give up and what, they're, um, uh, what, what we were willing to, um, whether it was on price or it was on functionality, there were areas where, where we were willing to uh, uh, give a little in the negotiation process. That's really important. But the other thing that's equally important is to understand what your customer is willing to give up. And after you've done a field trial with them and you've established a bit of a relationship, you'll often start to get uh, some, some good indication on what's important to them and what's maybe not so important to them. And sometimes there will be something that isn't that important to them that is actually costing you a lot to supply on the product side. So if they ask you to give something up, then in all fairness, you ask them to give something up as well. And knowing what they'll be okay to give up is really important. And uh, I always would, would stress that you need to, when you go into the negotiation process, you can't be having put your best foot forward because if you have, you don't have anything you can give up and things aren't going to go very far. But a great way to, to be able to establish a good relationship with that customer is to be able to back off on a few different things. I think you'll go into more of that uh, when you get into the, uh, to the sales lecture for sure. The final thing is the uh, post-evaluation and scalability. And, uh, you know, word of mouth and repeat orders are the best tools that you can have out there. And once you deliver your first sale, the, the process is not in any way o over. You need to make sure that that customer is talking positively about you with their peers and that they would go ahead and recommend you. Um, and this is an interesting point where the service part of your organization starts to very much take on a bit of a sales role as well. Because you'll start to transition the relationship with that customer over to the service group. And if you have a good service person, you know, they're always thinking about the next sale. And they can really help in facilitating the relationship further and making sure that you get those repeat orders. The other thing that was always um, important to me was making sure that we were high on, on what I would call our, our say-do ratio. So if we said we were going to provide something at a particular time, at a particular price, you know, we had to make sure that it was there. 
and build confidence of the customer. And often I would say, you know, well, that's going to take a month to get it there, knowing that we could have it there in two weeks and, you know, give a little time for any problems that came up in manufacturing or on the product development side, be able to exceed expectations and really focus on building that strong say-do ratio and trust with the customer. So just in summary, we've gone through quite a bit um, pretty quickly. And I just wanted to, to highlight some of the things that I, I feel are really important with a go-to-market strategy. So one that I talked a lot about was focusing on the customer's perspective and having their buying process um, in your mind all the time at the different stages. Involving all of the functional groups in your organization so a go-to-market strategy, it's not just sales and marketing. There's product development and the technical side that's equally important in that process. Fully understand the customer's problem. And uh, as I showed you in that example, being able to provide them with information that heightens their knowledge of the problem is all the better. Always know where your technology is going from a price point of view and from a functionality point of view so that you don't veer too far off the path of where you want to be when you're hitting some of these other markets along the way. Use data to prove your capabilities. Differentiate your solution. I talked a lot about partnerships as a way to differentiate your solution. And build a strong relationship um, with the company and, and with an an internal champion in that organization that you're trying to sell to. Um, so I'll open it up to, to questions at this time. Thanks, John. Yeah. Um, well, just, just one. I, th I think one of the scary parts of go-to-market strategy is when you first start negotiating and you don't have a lot of um, experience negotiating. I think a lot of people especially in the beginning, don't even know what can be negotiated. Um, how do you find out, just sorry, this is a question until we have some other people who have questions. How, how do you find out, get information about your customer and what your sort of negotiated area might be? Yeah. Like where do you get the information? Cause yeah. So the best place to get that information is probably usually uh, over a beer in the pub. <laughs> okay. I mean, you have to establish a good enough relationship with the customer so that you're aware of, of what they're, you know, what's important to them and so that you understand their organization really well. Um, to give you an example, what, what I always found is um, with our solutions, we would always build in a lot of functionality, right? Like I mentioned that every time a backup power system went off, we would get an email, we would know how long it ran, how much fuel it used, and all these things. A lot of information. We'd even know what temperature it was at the site. And the customer had specific things that they were interested in, but they didn't need all of that. So when we would go into negotiation, we would have a good enough understanding of, of what they, they had to have and what they didn't necessarily need to have. And so that, that would really help. And um, yeah, I think really it's just about having a good enough relationship that before you get to that stage, you've had some casual conversations around what's important to them and what's not as important to them. I think I've heard about, you know, when you're selling, say, software into big companies, there's so many levels of the buying process that if you start going in with too low thinking, you know, I, I just want to, I don't want to negotiate, I'm afraid to negotiate, I just want to be fair, I don't want to play games, but they'll negotiate you down. So you have to yeah. go in, because there's different levels that it has to be approved and everybody wants different things. Yeah, to, and to the start. other thing is that you want them to feel good about their purchase too. And people feel really good about their purchase if they left buying it at a lower price than what the conversation started at. And, uh, that, I mean, that's a win-win for, for everyone. If you can 
back off on price or you can back off on something in the negotiation process, then everyone feels really good about it. Question over here? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know how long was that cycle uh, in your case and maybe how, an idea of the percentage of the company um, budget that, that you need to allocate to be able to go through that phase because it seems like in your case it's a pretty long phase and when you want to yeah. pl plan for that you really need to have some money on the side to be able to go through that cycle I guess. Yeah, that's a really good question and that was something that was, um, let me just go back for a minute here. With these different markets, what we found was depending on um, the, the nature of the market we were selling into, that would kind of determine how long the decision process and the buying cycle was. Um, in some areas, like in, in telecom backup power, it would kind of be an annual budget where you would have to be there at the negotiation table in March because the money is being allocated at the end of March. And if you're not there at that point in time, then you're waiting until the following March in order to get in on their procurement schedule. Um, so, so that was one thing that we always had to pay attention to. The other thing was people would want trials for different periods of time. And um, some industries were much more conservative than others. But typically, um, we would be doing demos for um, areas that we weren't uh, going to be able to sell into for probably like a year at sometimes two years just because our, our price was too high at the time. But that's where it's important to know where your technology is going and what the timeline is on the product development side. So we would be able to uh, do some demonstrations in, in this market when we were still primarily focused on this one. And it would often be years. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, forgive me if uh, I'm a little bit off topic here, but I actually just had a, a question. Uh, it's not directly related to go-to uh, go -to market strategy, but just related to negotiation in general. Uh, I was wondering if you had any, um, any tips uh, for the flip side of the coin, which is for smaller companies that are trying to uh, negotiate with suppliers as opposed to buyers. Uh, especially, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of power in terms of, uh, you know, the volumes that you're able to purchase. Because uh, I know that that's a pretty tough, sort of a tough area for a lot of uh, smaller companies that are trying to negotiate with suppliers and have a, a little bit of the upper hand. Um, yeah. Do, do you have any tips for that? You know, often what we would do is uh, we would, in our proposals, we would give pricing based on different volumes. And uh, we would then push that pricing back down on our suppliers. Um, also, typically, um, I've been fortunate in that in most of the products that I've worked on, there's always more than one supplier. Um, so that helps a lot um, to be able to, uh, you know, put pressure on them with the fact that they know they have competition out there. Um, and the other thing that we would do, too, is um, we would combine volume between different markets. For example, we would combine our backup power volume with our um, electric mobility volume in a different market, uh, which was really helpful as well. But yeah, it's not an easy process to have to go through. Yeah. For sure. Uh, thanks. You mentioned the importance of having partners, particularly large partners, and I just wanted to know, in this example, how did you approach those partners? You know, what we found, and uh, actually, if I go to this for a second, what we found is that these large partners, they didn't have new technology, necessarily, and uh, they were looking for something. They were looking for some way to go to um, one of the big, let's use the telecom carriers as an example, they would identify one that they weren't working with. And they would go to them with our technology and say, we've partnered with this group and it's a new and novel technology. 
And it was actually a way for them to get in the door with customers that they didn't have before. And it worked out really well for them, not only because, I mean, they would be doing things uh, with us and building a relationship with us around our technology platform with that customer, but they would then start to sell some of their other products into that customer. And uh, one of the ways that we would attract them to work with us would be exactly that. We can help bring you to such and such carrier that we noticed you're not working with now. And um, it would be in the beginning stages just because that carrier was an early adopter and they wanted to try out one or they wanted to try out two. It was a way for the company to get in the door. Actually, that question actually relates to a little bit of what I was going to ask you is how do you actually get in the door? What do you find your best strategies are to um, get face-to-face -face and get to that eventual negotiation stage? Do you make cold calls? Do you find out who the key individual is and then you know, present them with a little bit of data? Yeah. How do you actually get in the door? Yeah, that's a good question. So to me, the best way to do that was to uh, present at conferences on the topic. And that way I would have an audience of, you know, 200 people that were the right people. Um, and I would, would put our white paper out there, talk about some of the claims of our technology, how we felt that we could help them. And at the end of it, I would have people come to me, you know, out of, instead of making 200 cold calls to little result, I would be able to, you know, walk out of one of those presentations with, 10 business cards in my hand from people that were genuinely interested in finding out more. So to me, that was a really important way to, uh, to, to get out there, was to target specific conferences and events. Um, so for, I guess negotiations is a big part of this and if anyone's interested, we have, we just did a best practices on negotiations a couple months ago and we'll post the link in, in our uh, Entrepreneurship 101 LinkedIn group um, to help you a little bit with that because it, it is such a grey area and it's uh, an area that requires a lot of practice in um, to sort of get the experience to know what you can do and when and all kinds of things. Um, thanks John very much for your great presentation. Yep. Thanks very much.